West Indies fans feeling a new sense of pride following their historic eight-run win over Australia in the second and final test, which ended on Sunday morning Caribbean time at the Gabba. The wind is ending a 27-year winless streak down under. Shamar Joseph, who was doubtful for the final day after an injury to his toe, made his way onto the field to deliver a fiery spell of 7 for 68, the best figures by a West Indian in a fourth innings against Australia. Joseph's spell helped dismiss the hosts for 207 in their pursuit of 215. Picking up from their overnight score of 2 for 60, Steve Smith was left not out on 91 while Cameron Green contributed 42. Alzara Joseph took 2 for 62 in support of Shamar as the Windes leveled the series at one apiece. Windes skipper Craig Brathwaite had words for Australian analyst the former fast bowler Rodney Hogg during the post-match presentation but before him let's hear from the Aussie captain Pat Cummings. I love it. Super. You know, I can't complain. We, we won a test match in Australia, so it's, it's amazing. Lose. What do you think this will do for West Indies cricket? Ready, 41. Um, does a lot. It means again, a lot for us. Obviously, it's been a number of years winning since we won a test again. match here. Um, but my message to the group is that this is the beginning. Um, I think it's amazing. We enjoy this. But I think this has to continue. Yeah, obviously, disappointment after a loss, but that was a fantastic no, test match uh, and a fantastic series. Um, you know, I thought, in particular, Shamal, the way he bowled today. Uh, yeah, he's, he's right up for it and uh, unfortunately weren't good enough. Yeah, there you have it from uh, Craig Brathwaite first and then the Australian captain Pat Cummins following the historic win for the West Indies over Australia at the Gamba in Brisbane on Sunday. Let's get Fazir Mohammed in on this discussion as we look back at what was an incredible game, an incredible performance from the West Indies, a stunning victory and a stunning effort from Shamar Joseph on the final day after he had been struck on the toe, forced to retire hurt on the penultimate, what turned out to be the penultimate day of the test match. Faz, welcome. I feel as if it's the sort of day where I just open the floor and say to you, say whatever you want to open this discussion. Well, Ricardo, I'm just glad that there's been a day and a piece to sort of absorb what went on. Uh, precisely just after three o'clock in the uh, in the uh, in the morning Eastern Caribbean time, just after two in Jamaica. But even with all that time, it's really difficult to fathom. Uh, it, it, it's not so much about being at a loss for words, but trying to place it in context. And in the start of the show, I think you all encapsulated the remarkable story of Shamar Joseph. I mean, even if the West Indies had lost the match, even if at the end they had won by eight wickets. Shamar Joseph was already a star of this two-match series. But to hit the top of our stump and, and, and to, to, to really culminate in the dramatic manner in which he did, I, I mean, it's beyond the stuff of dreams. And, and you almost have to, to say, well, you know, what else can he do from here? But, but really, it, it is the sort of performance individually that really you hope will, will, will lift not just his teammates, because I'm sure it has already, but everyone associated with West Indies cricket and to recognize that, can this be a platform? Can this be the springboard? Because we've had moments before, famous victory at Headingley in 19, uh, sorry, 2017 over England, the Triple Crown of 2016, winning in Sharjah against Pakistan in 2016. But, but it, it hasn't been that springboard. So I will just leave it for the moment and say that, look, there's so much to absorb and put in context in relation to not just that victory, but the fighting spirit of the West Indies in the two test matches that you can only hope that it can really mean something far more meaningful for the players themselves and for West Indies test match cricket in particular. Yeah, very much the case, fans. We have seen in the last... 25, 30 years, um, West Indies performances, and you referenced some of them in another format or in other formats, the T20 format, the 50 over format. But even in the test format, we've had, you know, those 
small victories. I remember England being bowled out for 51, I think it was. West Indies uh, winning that encounter, chasing 417 against Australia, the world record um, that was in the Caribbean. But this victory, does it? And, and, and not to fall into the trap of recency bias, but does this one does this one stand out in a in a more significant way to you? Of course it does because of all those factors that you've already mentioned. Brisbane, which carries the nickname not just of the Gabba but the Gabatoa, because it's a place where usually visiting teams are ripped to pieces, with the exception exception of course of India three years ago. Before that, you have to go back to 1989 and the West Indies as well winning at that venue. And, and that was a time when the West Indies were the most dominant force in the history of the game. So, so yes, it's, it, there is going to be recency bias because many are asking, is this the greatest test match victory for the West Indies? I think it's too early to say. I think this is the greatest upset victory in the history of West Indies test match cricket. Again, for all those reasons, the rank of the West Indies, the rank of Australia playing at the Gabba, all of the other factors tied into it, I see it as the greatest upset victory in the history of West Indies Test Match cricket. But there's so much else to absorb in relation to West Indies cricket before we, we go that route of, of branding it as the greatest victory ever. And, and again, I think it's very important, Ricardo, Mariah, Lance, to again be mindful that West Indies needs to escape from the trap of individual moments, as you just referred to, Ricardo, because the next series is going to be against England in England. It's really up to the West Indies to take advantage of the four-day tournament coming up, proper preparation, to show that when they step on the field at Trent Bridge in July, in the early days of July, that they have that same level of commitment, fighting spirit, dedication, and quality to, to carry this on beyond this celebratory experience. Yeah, and you have made the point so often on this show, Faz, and, and even um, while not directly just now that the West Indies will not play Test Match Cricket again until July, and so such a long time between now and then to build on the success that we had in Australia. But I do want to get your thoughts on the reactions, especially from some Australians, Tim Payne, um, criticizing um, Adam Gilchrist for his celebration with Brian Lara at the end of the match. Also some criticism coming in for Justin Langer, who apparently was giving some of the West Indies um, batsmen tips, I, I guess, on how to deal with the Australian wickets, or maybe just generally on how to improve criticism for Pat Cummins as well, on how glowing he was of the West Indies performance at the post-match press conference, although that seemed to change slightly at the post-match presentation, although that seemed to change slightly at the press conference. Your own thoughts on the reactions to the reaction of West Indies winning? You'll always find people who take exception to you praising your opponents after they've beaten you. Because those individuals are locked into that Stone Age mentality that this is a war, that you have to hate one another, that you, you have to go to the point of insulting each other. And, and if that is happening in Australia, as I'm sure it is, and it's happened in the Caribbean because you hear people making all sorts of comments about the opposition and, 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 and turning a blind eye to what's going on with their own teams, I would reference again Australia and 1960-61. The way the Australians welcomed that team led by the late great Frank Worrell. And, the, and, and maybe they should learn why the trophy that was being held up, a bit embarrassingly by, by the captain of Australia because the team had just lost, why it's called the Frank Worrell Trophy, why it was named after Frank Worrell and not Richie Benno, who was the opposing captain. Both men who played that series hard, fair, fierce on the field, but always in the right spirit of the game. And therefore, whether it's a Rodney Hogg, whether it's whoever, whether it's anybody in the Caribbean who takes exception to people praising opponents and, and, and loading their efforts and their, their sportsmanship and so on, they need, first of all, to grow up 
and secondly to realize that the stone age was a few thousand years ago yeah and just to add to that faz you know pat cummings after you know exchanged his playing shirt with shamar joseph especially because Everybody understood the context of Shamar playing. The story was making the headlines even before Shamar decided to do anything spectacular. And then you have Ian Healy criticizing Pat Cummins, saying that, you know, maybe he should just focus on Australia and their shortcomings because there were a lot of shortcomings. And, you know, just singling out the fact that a captain has recognized another player and his talent. Forgive me again, Mariah, for referencing 6061, but... Frank Quarrell presented his blazer to Richie Benno. He called it his body, presented his cap, called it his scalp. And, it, and, and again, that, that, that's why, you know, it's so disappointing when you have people who should know better. Leave it for us non-players. Leave it as far as fly-by-night fanatics and poor losers to behave like that. Because when you're in the cut and thrust of high-level international competition, from what I have seen, whether close quarters or for some considerable distance, there's a healthy respect for your opponent. There's a, there's a lot of aggro on the field, no question about it, but there's a healthy respect to the point where you are happily willing to acknowledge what they would have achieved. Not that you're happy that they win, that they've beaten you, yeah. but you're happy to see the, 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 the fruits of their labor, even if in some cases it's at your own expense. Yeah, there's a reason they call it the gentleman's game, so... I think it doesn't, it's not called that for no reason, right? But Mariah, we don't have time to spare for that. <laughs> that talk about a gentleman's game, one of these good days, I'll give you my context on the gentleman's game. Please. And hopefully I'll never say that again. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to hear that, Faz. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back because we're going to pick up this cricket discussion. I wish Faz would tell me now. Okay.